Welcome to Season 5 of She Ventures. I am your host, Doria Lavanino. She Ventures is a podcast about women and their work and life pivots. I believe in the power of storytelling. I also believe that if you change one woman's life, you start to change a family or a community. Our mission is to elevate the diverse stories of everyday women in their work. One promise, no mansplaining ever. Sit back, listen, and hit subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us at sheventurespodcast.com. Data science has traditionally left out Black Americans, and the result is centuries of faulty, inaccurate, and even harmful information collected about communities, not only across the nation, but across the world. What if we could start to rebuild communities and eliminate poverty using a data-led approach that is more inclusive of the voices and experiences of more brown and black people? Our guest today is trying to accomplish exactly that. She's a 20-year veteran in marketing, communications, and operations who pivoted to become founder and principal of Ford Momentum, a firm that uses an MIT-informed system to fight systemic issues she's witnessed and likely experienced. And she's here today to speak about her work. Maya Ford, welcome to She Ventures. Thank you, Doria. Great to see you all and hear you all. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for doing this podcast in the midst of moving, no less, shows your your uh, your ability to, to be very agile. <laughs> That's definitely one of those cool components of the 21st century. I say that complexity is the new black. <laughs> I like that. So let's start with a brief overview of your background. And I'm so curious how that led you to start and create Ford Momentum? I'm an all-American girl. I was born and raised in Texas and then Florida. I'm the kid of an immigrant father and an American mother. And that really developed a lot of my life experiences. But when you're a kid, you're not in control. You don't know. You're just doing what the environment tells you to do so that you can survive. And then hopefully you'll have this life where you can thrive. And turns out that I was really curious as a kid. I grew up in a very naturalistic environment where I was always camping and fishing, doing things outdoors. I was always riding my bicycle. All of these things that America says Black people don't do. I did very naturally. I grew up vegetarian. My mother was a biology teacher, and she just always loved science. I grew up bilingual. All of these things, right, that America constantly says that Blacks or Hispanics don't do. And so as I moved into my career in marketing and communications, I would always be the one who challenged, like, but where do we get that information from, right? Or like, who said that? (laughs) You know, like, that's not what we do. And I don't tend to kind of hang out or pay attention to a lot of comedians, but comedy is only funny when, to me, when it's something that people actually do. So... I think that oftentimes I would even hear things that were like racist or biased jokes that were things that those cultures didn't even do. And so it just became a part of my confidence, a part of my temperament to challenge that, but also to ask, if it's not this, then what is it instead? Ford Momentum stems from that, more from curiosity and just wanting to get it right with people. Like, are we calling this thing the same thing? Do we value the same thing? Do we Are we operating on the same path? And what happens is that leads into the more traditional concepts of leadership and goal setting, change management. So it tackles a lot of issues at once, and it's just part of my natural character. It reminds me of how, when we think about history, it's written by the people, typically, who are in control And so, so many voices are ignored and that has been 
many people's experience over and over and over again. I wanted to know, how did you start Ford Momentum? I mean, like all of a sudden say, I want to do this new data collection. Well, I guess, firstly, let's talk about in layperson's terms. Can you explain how it's different than what typical data collection would be? The 21st century is such a great time for tools. And really the end of the 20th century was as well. We had this onslaught of social media and with the social media platforms, you had more interpersonal data than we had ever seen before. And it was amassed by the billions and no one knew what to do with it. And so if you have someone who's interpreting the information improperly or they don't even know what to look for, you're missing out on what data is good for. I liken it to baking a cake. What type of cake do you want to bake? What type of ingredients will you need? And if you have these amazing ingredients and you don't even know what they're for, you're missing out. It's the same thing. And ultimately, I was working in public health care, community health care, which was such an exciting job that constantly pivots. I love this topic, pivoting. And I was managing a marketing and communications department. And we did some really deep work in HIV prevention and taboo. And taboo is a very powerful thing because it brings shame. It talks about a lot of social concepts, economic concepts, emotional. These are things that the data might have kind of these prolific journals, but not necessarily community data that solves regional or local problems. So we found a lot of success using this kind of model. I'm using my air quotes this model, but really it's a scientific method because I grew up in the scientific world. And so I was just able to apply that locally and we got remarkable results. And I also noticed that it didn't hurt. A lot of times people don't like change because they feel that it's going to hurt. And this allowed us to be able to to move change along where people might have some trepidation, They might have a little bit of friction, which is very natural. You have to have that for growth. But ultimately, when they got to the other side, they were like, my God, we did that. And so it it created a stronger sense of cohesion. I left that organization because the leadership was really poor. They were benefiting from my innovation. They were benefiting from my curiosity, my strong leadership, my model, but the executive director screamed at me one day and was like, what the F are you asking me this for? And was highly inappropriate, but that executive director had gotten away with that for years. And I had to practice my own model to ask myself, what are my standards for how I'm conducting this work? And if I am willing to give away what I know works, what I practice, what I firmly believe in, is it my fault or is it their fault? And that's where I had to take ownership of my own guidance, my own ability, and bet on myself. And I did that. It wasn't easy. It's never easy. But you talk about pivot. I cashed out. I was 39 years old. And I said, you got to do this now, girl. Or, And if you fail, you can go get a job. You'll learn something. And uh, I cashed out my 401k. And I did it. And I... I messed up a lot. I spent a lot of that money on things that were not necessary, but we're still here today to talk about it. So I always love to just when people are willing to admit that they've messed up, I just like to ask if there are one or two things that you could tell an entrepreneur that are areas that you feel you wish you hadn't done, uh, what would they be? Get mentorship. And it doesn't have to be in your field. One thing I did very well, and I've done this throughout my career, is I've been intentional about having diverse mentors. So I have two women, three men, all of different ethnicities. Three of them are not U.S. born. All of them either work for major conglomerates or are entrepreneurs. And this helped me tremendously because you have to practice, stop, and then pivot. Practice, stop, pivot. It's all about practice. 
The other thing I would do is be very conscientious about how you're spending money and don't do it without a plan that you want to see very specific results. For example, I knew that I was doing this great work. We had big ideas to make this a global platform and to try to even go for the Nobel level, which is very complicated to do because you need, I'm a for-profit business, right? So like I'm not nonprofit, I'm not in the educational space. There's all of these layers, but I needed help through publicity. So we set very specific goals with a professional to help us to figure out the strategy. And that professional did such a remarkable job. We set out an 18 month plan. They accomplished that in six months, but we had to know where we were going and strategy, even if it doesn't work, get a strategy. Don't just trust your instinct alone, trust your instinct and work with pros. And the last thing is be willing to work with the best in people for as long as you can. So I started this business and I hired at the time, oil and gas was kind of going through one of their big layoffs. And I was able to hire a brilliant young oil and gas designer, corporate infrastructure architect for pennies on the dollar because she just took interest in what I did. And so she did this with Ford Momentum while she was looking for full-time work. And that system that she developed carried me through where I am today. So seven years in, now I need to redevelop the system. But I was able to hire best in class. I only got to keep her for six months. It didn't matter. She set me up. I love that. And that is incredible. And you're right. Like If you are intentional in looking for things, you will find what you need. It may not be how you expect it or in the package you expect it, but it will show up. (laughs) That's a great point. Don't be so fixed on one way to do things. And that has been, as someone who might lean, definitely probably leans more type A, it's very easy to get caught in like how I want to see it. And I've had to learn to go for the root cause and be flexible and be really open to learning in different ways. And that I've been so well rewarded for that. That's a great point, Doria. Absolutely. Learning is so key, right? And being humble and, and knowing that, I mean, I make a hundred mistakes a day, and but it also means I'm learning. <laughs> exactly. Entrepreneurship is probably the most humbling experience anyone ever has. So I learned a little bit about Stolo, and I hoped you could talk about that and how it is different than how data is collected. The only examples that I can think of as a journalist are, you know, like the census or Bureau of Labor Statistics. Yes, those are great ones. We need both. So what I think America does very well is it innovates very quickly. What I think America doesn't do well is nuance. What we learn is that the devil is in the details. The brother who wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff actually died of a heart attack, I think, on an airplane. And so like prevention is a pound of cure. Those are really important things to how residents, citizens live our lives today. America's nuance is what makes us feel loved and cared for and not a cog in the system, even though it's a massive system. What I think we do well is we have these great tools for big, big data collection, but they're still fundamentally not good at isolating smaller concerns in regional areas. And that's important because the United States is vast and we have a lot of tools and resources and assets that need careful attention to. So Economics 101 is about maximizing the tools, resources that you have as an asset. But if you gloss it over and you don't get into the benefit or the value of those assets, then you're missing out on whole opportunities to control your utility. Stolo, is a model that allows us to do that at a local level. It could be applied 
at a regional or national level, if you're talking about a population, a good example is in radio. Right now, we don't carry radio statistics to the same detail for Hispanic populations or Black populations as we do Anglo populations. So when you're talking about radio advertising or data sets in other newer platforms like online radio, you're missing out on whole elements of language, what people consider important to them, what their assets are. And that's, to me, not good marketing. It's shoddy and it's sloppy because we do have the tools to do it today. So standard of love is really, or STOLO, is really about identifying the standards that communities have. And then we're asking them what makes them feel loved. Love means different things to different people. It's not all the Victorian principled idea today of like wife at home, picket fence, three kids and and a dog and husband and wife. We're seeing that language is nuanced. It's changing whether you like it or not. We need to have a model that allows people to feel safe in that in the environments that they're developing. So it's a really easy model. It's free to use. It's like the scientific method. So the scientific method doesn't tell you if your theory is right or wrong. It carries you through the steps to identify whether or not you might be able to debunk your theory or prove it. And STOLO is the same thing. It's asking you to be very clear about what it is that you're talking about. And then it's asking you to weight its value and how much it's worth to you, how much you would protect it for. What would you do to make sure that it's reproducible or not reproducible, right? So that's basic utility. And then it's asking you about your self-esteem. When I talked about how I felt in the management at the community health center, that was about my self-esteem. I was doing the work, but these elements were not compensating me emotionally, economically, or physically to be able for for me to carry it forward in a sustainable way. That's where the self-esteem comes in. Do something that helps you to protect that and protect yourself. And when you get that in order, then you can move into the economic power of it And when you move into economic power or sustainability, it's not all money. Economics is not just about cash. It's about a whole series of currencies at play. And when you get that balance right, that's when you have justice, fairness, peace, closure, completion. So it's a it's a cycle. And what we're we're still learning, Doria, but what we're learning is like it's dynamic. It offers a way for people to be authentically seen and heard and accountable to themselves and then their communities. I know that you did a project in Houston, and I wondered if you could just, because it might give a more of a practical framework to see how STOLO works and the results that you got and how, how you were able to implement them, or I guess you make recommendations, or how, I, I'm not actually quite sure how it all works. People are having a hard time putting two and two together. Like you get paid to go ask these questions for people and then what happens to the data? So what we do is we go in ahead of planning so that in a mathematical equation, we say garbage in, garbage out. If you have the wrong numbers in your equation, you're going to get the wrong answer. And so in this case, we're putting in the right variables, the right details, the right communications elements so that you get the right outcome. We went in Harris County, which is the third largest county in the nation. More than 5 million people live there with, I don't know how many square miles, but it incorporates more than 34 cities. So the city of Houston is two thirds of that. So you can imagine like Houston's this big chunk of it. And then there's 33 other cities. We go and it's a very diverse place. You have multiple languages, Spanish and English being the most predominant, but you've got Urgu, Urdu, Tagalog, Vietnamese, Chinese, French. You have a lot of East and West African nations that come. So persons are leaning on 
the government and their municipalities, their local community organizations, and businesses to do a lot. It's a very dynamic space. Because it's so large, it's also a very chaotic space. This project was focused on housing, and we titled it My Home is Here, because people are living here, and you want to protect and have a sense of home. Everyone deserves that. So we went to ask, what makes home accessible for you? Viable, sustainable, happy, healthy, safe, innovative, allows you to have access to the future of work. And we did this all throughout the county using different methods of communication. So we used radio, television, games through gamification, which was a a new tool. It worked brilliantly. That's brilliant. I love that. Fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. And then we did the good old human touch. So we had interviews, focus groups, and we're collecting all of this data. And we're splitting it according to STOLO and the variables that the client, Harris County, needed to make a plan for housing for the next 10 years. This is really vital for this region because it suffers from a lot of environmental shocks. In the past seven years, it's had two hurricanes and five floods that have been devastating to the community. So people are still suffering from the constant just blowback. It's just wave after wave after wave. And the county and the federal government have to come up with a way to keep people safe and design housing that works. What we did informed that plan. That plan now is being implemented through some really great components that look at equity, safety, affordability, housing infrastructure, how much housing can you put in an area so that it's not too dense, but dense enough so that it maximizes the resources for everyone? Are you looking out for seniors? Are you looking out for young people? Are you lowering environmental risk by not forcing people to drive vehicles? Are you making it inclusive so that Amaya Ford can grow from entry level to senior executive and then go back to living in the same community as a senior. These are all elements that inform the plan. And today they've begun by doing some pretty prolific things that are controversial, but the right thing to do. We'll start to see this roll out more and more over the decade, but we informed the details that they needed to build the plan upon. That's really exciting and cool. How long does it take to, from start to finish, to do a project like that? And it must be expensive. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Harris County is a big beast. The entire study was $4 million. Our portion in communications was a million and a half. And we used the majority of that on mass communications, so digital radio, outdoor, advertising, and then it was in the middle of COVID. So we didn't get to do as much of the human element as we would prefer, but we did some innovative work by using digital kits to employ local residents and we trained them to do this work. So we practice circular economics, which keeps the money in a region by working with local persons. So that was very successful and it took about 18 months. A smaller, for example, we're doing this work in Las Vegas and in El Paso. Those are smaller regions, and you can do the work in about nine. But it's really up to the community and the community. We want people, everyone to have skin in the game. So the municipality is there to serve residents, which municipalities forget sometimes. But it's also the job of residents to inform municipalities of what it is that they want. We are the bridge to help those two things happen. Do you typically get leads from government RFPs or is it word of mouth or how does that work? It's a little bit of both. In the seven years that we've been doing this, we find that we're not a solo product or a solo service. We always partner. And that's what we're really good at in the pivoting. So I call our team pollinators. 
bees are our brand and bees are really brilliant in nature because they've got little pockets on their legs to collect pollen, which is data. And that data is being transferred amongst all of the different elements in a region. And they're doing that very quickly. They're highly, they're communicating with each other intuitively. They have a system, they can heat up and create warmth. They can huddle together. They can kind of like leave drips of information. They design communications networks. We do the same thing. Every single move we make actually is mimicking nature. So we're mimicking elements of what's happening in nature. We've even designed strategies that mimic COVID. We're paying attention because we as humans are a part of nature. We are constantly doing this. And what we find is that the pollination works in a lot of different ways. Sometimes Doria might say, hey, this is really out of our scope and we don't know how to address this issue. I know a lady, let's call Maya. And let's see if Maya can get to this population that doesn't trust anyone, that's very concerned or difficult to reach. What might she recommend? And so we're able to serve in that way. Or it could be a larger, more organized effort where you've got to have like a very specific type of recorded data that is got some legal elements. And we're very familiar with how to do that with a county, a state, or a federal organization, agency. And so we get in there and we work with the larger teams to, to collaborate there. Our strength is being nimble, it's being curious, and it's not being afraid to fail. So we have integrity, we are healthy, we provide a lot of self-care because most of the work we're doing is going into the intricacies of people's dislikes or their concerns or their trauma. We spend a lot of time on rest. I actually take a nap every day. We just have to take care of ourselves so that we can be ready to serve others. So it works. We're nimble. We work to serve and to get this model out because we believe that it can create a new sense of order. And we're not saying what that order has to be right or wrong, but we do need to organize it differently in the 21st century. I completely agree. And I love how nuanced all of the questions that you've brought up are. And it's interesting what you said about the census, because I've, I've filled out the census before. And it's, it's, it is, it's very factual, but there is no nuance in it at all. I can see how it's missing on so many key points about people's lives. It doesn't even see it. And something like the census is done every decade. So a lot changes. When you get a major storm in your region, and let's say it's three years into the census, people have left or pe people are moving in to conduct reconstruction and you still need to provide in those gaps. So it's not saying that the census doesn't have its place. I would say the census is like the building, the house, yeah, the foundation, maybe. The foundation. Each room in the home has a different purpose. And you might need to change those rooms daily, monthly, or by season, quarterly, to be able to meet your needs. America is a great place. The United States is a great place because we have all the tools and resources to do that today. Whereas 20 years ago, they were still very clunky, but now they're not. And so when we talk about inclusion, the biggest problem for me is what got me into this work to begin with, is that the values that are important to me as a Black Latina were never included in that foundation. One of the most unfair things, I think, in the census or in any demographic survey is the block of Asians, right? So it says, are you Black, non-Hispanic? Anglo, non-Hispanic, Asian, and then like indigenous or South Pacific Islander. But do you know how many countries Asia, yeah, fit Asians? Right? Like it's just it's, you're so right. Nuance, and it's so unfair. There's a complete and utter difference of a Pakistani to a Vietnamese. Yes. <laughs> like, or like, even someone from India. Yeah. I mean, the India and Pakistan are completely different, different religions, 
different languages, different, it's just different terrain. And so that's still how we're operating is that the foundation is still blocking Asian as like one thing, even though India has outpaced China on <laughs> on population. And so like these things to me are just baffling. And we know that if you cannot serve Indians, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, people from Burma, Afghanistan, you're not getting communications right. And we're not just talking about production and consumption. You're not talking about just buying and selling things. You're talking about millions of people who live together, who need to share basic natural resources, and we need to get along. So if you're going to have us get along, you have to include us in processes, policies, the ability to produce and consume equitably. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And we're mandating this higher standard today as people who look like me. We're not asking. We're saying there's another way and we're not looking to displace anyone, but you're going to include us and we're going to create a higher standard. Here are those elements that you need to include. And anyone can include them in their work. It doesn't hurt. It's a do no harm business. Diversity only makes things better. It makes your product and your service stronger, tighter. It doesn't hurt. How would you say that you measure in the seven years that you've been doing this? How do you measure success in your work? We're so early that we haven't seen the development of what we are informing come to life. So I cannot tell you, this was highly successful. We informed this 10-year housing plan, and look, it's so diverse economically, ethnically. I can't tell you those things yet. What brings me the most joy and immediate satisfaction is when I get it right, people say they feel emotionally connected to the work because they see themselves reflected in it. So if I can get you, Doria, to be like, that's right. You nailed it. I'm in it. And in a crazy way, my neighbor's in it and I don't even like her. That is <laughs> awesome. And it's happening. So when people can come to that space to see themselves and be okay with seeing others, whether they agree or disagree, that is an inkling of getting it right. Some interesting things about where I don't know is what happens when our standards cannot be met yet in an environment or if they're too stringent and how does that impact our self-esteem? So I'm going through that daily, right? I'm like, nope, I determined that this is my standard and I'm not bending and I know that it's right. I've done all the work, but it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel balanced because I can't push it through yet. Either it doesn't exist or I have a lot of stress with others to get it done. And I feel isolated and alone in that. And I can't tell still if that's a human thing, if that's a leadership thing, a temperament thing. So there's still a lot to work out. But to get it right so far, usually people ask us to come back because they feel that we do a good job of of what's called mirroring. We're reflecting you in an authentic, safe, healthy way. I love that. And I've been thinking a lot about that concept in a completely unrelated way with chat GBT. And, and I like mirroring because I feel like what's been happening a lot is hallucination or I don't even know what to call it, but it's not reflective of anyone that I know and how they think. And so it's remarkable to me that it's gone on this way for so long. You're giving me goosebumps because I'm stuttering. I completely agree with you. It's um, ChatGPT. I've been doing a lot of practice with it and trying to understand its benefits. I love tools. The reason that I was even able to start this business was because the cost of entry for tools was so inexpensive. It was so low. Whereas a decade ago, if I needed an Adobe Suite account, it could be $10,000 for a license. 
Whereas when I started this business, it got down to $600 a year. Tools are really great to help us to, to be more human. And that's where we use them. But they can also be a crutch. And if you have the tool doing more than it needs to, I tell people, you don't use a jackhammer to get spinach out of your teeth, right? <laughs> so like, don't use that tool. It requires nuance. I think the hallucination statement is real. I think that what's been happening is the keyboard warrior can make us feel overconfident. And as we're reading very quickly, we're not processing or you're getting mm-hmm. visuals very quickly. You need a moment to process and to humans are still very tactile. We're social beings. And if that pollination isn't sticking, then it can create a form of mania. Those delusions have caused, are causing people a lot of stress. I don't know how chat GPT is going to fare in that either. TBD, right? But, you know, it is interesting and it could just be an association, not necessarily causation, but, you know, we're in a mental health crisis in in this country. And I often wonder if, I'm not going to blame it on technology because I don't believe that, but I do believe that the authenticity of human interactions is an issue at play. I agree. It's just overuse of a tool. And some of us are better prepared than others. So one thing is I've suffered from mental health issues probably since I was a teenager, from depression, in college, I was suicidal. These are all things that are a part of my narrative and how I extend empathy, sympathy, and compassion in this work. I've had the blessing of getting a lot of support and health, either through the medical system or through therapy or through community, because I'm open about my foibles as a human. I'm a human's human. And I think that when I have found myself being in social media and saying things like, can you believe Doria said that? How stupid. Why would she even do such and such? What a jerk. Like, what'd you do to me, Doria? <laughs> like, I haven't even seen you in years. Like, what happened? <laughs> you know, like, so it just became, it became a little bit like, calm down, girl. And that's when I had to get off. When I, when I would find myself being on social media and being angry at things that didn't even happen to me, it just, I realized like, this is not a healthy part for my emotional well being. And maybe it is for everyone else, but this isn't a standard that I can uphold. From It doesn't improve my health or my well-being. And I think that we have to get to that point again of self-love and accountability. It's not your fault, Doria. That's my own triggers for whatever reason. And so I have to be accountable to me to make sure that like I'm just not living in that space. Stop it. I love the fact, firstly, that you're authentic about mental health, because I too have had my own journey with mental health issues. And I think it we need to talk about it to normalize it. And I unfortunately, I feel that people get uncomfortable talking about it for whatever various reasons. So thank you for that, firstly. I also agree that that it's not technology and, and there is an accountability that we we have as people. Like at the end of the day, it's what is it that I can do to make the situation better? Not not just in regards to myself, but like the situation better as a community. And lastly, and these are all kind of like I have ADD, so like my thoughts are all over the place. But the other thing that you said was you talk about self-care. And that is something that it's taken me so long to learn is essential. It is not selfish. It's necessary. And I'm just grateful that you brought that up. I question how we perceive mental health in the United States relative to communications. And I also question concepts like ADD because I also was diagnosed as an adult Yeah, me too. (laughs) I was like, I didn't know that. (laughs) And it makes a lot of sense, right? But what I would argue, because I have lived abroad, what I argue is that the pace is slower in other places where I'm not constantly splitting my attention. 
and I'm allowed to slow down and focus on one thing at a time. So environment plays a lot in how we respond to our livelihood. My mother is a dentist and she raised us, reminding us that a human only gets sick in like three or four ways, through the mouth or like through an orifice, any orifice, eye, nose, ears, mouth, genitalia, environmental, or it's in your DNA. The one thing that you can control the most is the orifice. But environment and DNA, you can't really control. Well, most of us cannot. So some of us have enough privilege to be able to change our environments more frequently. I'm one of those people, but most of us don't. When we think of it that way, from a, a human as a part of nature, then I think that we have to give credence to the accountability of managing our wellness in the way that we can. And then Stolo can give us the opportunity to create some more boundaries in the environment. They're not fixed because nature is constant chaos, but it allows us to at least create a shelter for ourselves that we know we want to move towards at all times. I love that you said that and made me reflect on what I had just said, because it's also, it pathologizes unnecessarily. And you're right, it is so much about the environment and our accountability and how we choose to interact with it, to your point, as much as we can, because some of us don't have a choice as to where we are at any given time. Poverty limits our Economic, like our financial, so like the current currency, it limits our resources and, ass and assets. It reduces. My work is seated in increasing, just first of all, highlighting that there are other currencies at play and increasing their value so that you have more options to move around with. And as technology evolves, we, we've talked a little bit about chat, GBT, and I'm sure there are many other things I don't even know about. How do you think it will play out in terms of addressing marginalized communities? Is it going to help? Is it going to become inaccessible? My studies through MIT's DEDP program is focused on data, economics, and development policy. And there's three baselines to people who are suffering from poverty. It's inequitable access to tools and resources. It's policies or laws that actually make that legal. And then it's not taking advantage of geographic assets. If you're dealing with a population that is impoverished or dealing like suffering from poverty, the first way you want to tackle it is through that top tier is access to tools and resources and the policies. But then you can also push from the bottom up, which is to inform or help people recognize that they probably have all the tools and resources that are not highlighted right in front of them. And they could use those things to catapult or create or displace the current economic framework to catapult themselves out of it. Where I think it's complicated is that people who are suffering from poverty spend a lot of their time and effort on just making it day by day. And they don't have a lot of time to improve literacy. This is a space that Ford Momentum and Stolo don't do well, is that we can access persons who are suffering from poverty, but we have not figured out how to get them to slow down enough before they speed up. And that's really what it requires is like knowledge, education, and mass support. I think municipalities are starting to get a better handle on this concept. And that's where we come in to work with municipalities. That's wonderful. What came to mind when you said that is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And like, exactly, right? That very bottom one, if your very basic needs are not being met, it is impossible to focus on the next level, which, which might be literacy. That makes perfect sense to me. And I'm glad that you're uncovering that. I just spent six months in West Africa studying entrepreneurship, global entrepreneurship with Lagos Business School, which was a remarkable opportunity in an effort to pivot because 
I see the vision. I'm really enjoying my time with you because I see us reflecting in each other. And I needed that in a space that wasn't the United States. And Lagos is like organized chaos. I don't know if you've been there. Have you been there yet? I've been there one time 20 years ago. (laughs) Girl, it hasn't changed. (laughs) (laughs) It was pretty chaotic. I will say that. (laughs) It's nuts and amazing. And what I learned, what I came home with, I'm still unpacking the lessons. But one of the, the lessons I came home with is how courageous it is for people who are suffering from poverty to do everything it takes to get out. That for them to get out is more than work. It was more than like labor. It required probably that they stopped 90% of what they knew to do and they tried something radically different in whole other ways that they had no idea how to do. This is one has been one of the greatest examples of courage. And I've brought that home because I think that more of us can stand to think like West Africans, Nigerians think in that way. They're willing to like stop in chaos and completely, they're the kings and queens of pivot. They want to get out. Those who are suffering from poverty are willing to do what it takes. And that's a very hard thing to do. It's very hard. And I would imagine then as you have these experiences, they begin to also inform your work and your perspective even more. I hope that they don't make judgments for me. They just become part of the nuance, like information that I can lean into the data so that an experience isn't foreign because I'm very cautious about being the person who doesn't have to stay in a space and like having all of this information, like I know something. I just try to lean on it to ask questions. As we wrap up, I wanted to ask you, as a woman of color, as someone who's involved with data, how have you been received, generally speaking? I think that I am a very blessed person to have never met a stranger. So I'm usually well-received in spaces. I think I'm pretty affable until I'm not. And I think in the communities, because I'm sens- I'm very sincere, I'm authentic, and I'm very flexible, like I eat anything that doesn't move, I mix amongst classes, that's very abnormal. Most people stay within their own class, their own social class. And so I can reach the transient person from city to city to, you know, somebody in Congress. And I think that that allows people to trust my observations. And also I'm someone who really likes to be accountable to the work. So we're very detailed. And if you ask me a question about it, I've got notes on notes on notes. And so I can go back to the data. We have an order of operations. So we're accountable and and clear. And in that, people really receive us very well, me and my team. Sometimes I find that when we're dealing in cultures that have friction, so like if it's a conversation about race, which is not a term that I use, but about ethnicity. And so you're in an an Anglo power structure with persons of color who are saying, "Mm, you're not including me or that's not right. There's anxiety. And I'm trying to come in to state like, hey, these are whole nuances that you didn't even know existed. You need to trust me that we're guiding you in the right direction. And this happens about 50% of the time where the, the current dominant power structure cannot let go. And that causes friction because then I'm like, what the F did you hire me for? <laughs> You're like, Don't waste my time. We have, a, we have 50% of these people who are willing to listen and try and 50% who wanted it to maybe dip their toe in the water or for tokenism. And I'm not friendly about that 50%. I, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't be either. Would you say that of the clients that you've had that they've kind of been 50-50 in terms of their dedication to yes. real change? It's 50-50. And we have to remember that people are coming with whole life experiences. 
with an education system that fundamentally tells us that many of the assets of black and brown communities, because they don't have money, that they're not valuable, even though it's those assets and those communities that keep America thriving, we're not talking about a mind shift. We're going for an intent, like the whole equational shift. And that that is change management pivoting literally millions of times in a year, billions probably, for people who are on their own cycles and their own timeframes with their own histories. This is a generation of work, not in five to seven years. To your point, I was going, my last question was going to be, where do you want to see yourself 10 years from now? But being that it takes so long for the change that you recommend then to be implemented and then to see the results. I'm going to kind of skip that question because I think you've answered it. Your values or the values are of what you reflect from the community. And that's how I've understood it, informs the data and informs the recommendations. It's going to be really interesting. We know that most innovators or inventors are not the people who bring their products and services to the market. My favorite example is the VCR or the videotape. Like no one remembers the first VCR company. They'll tell you it was JVC or Sony, but it wasn't. It was an obscure group out of the Midwest who had done that. And they were in the market for five to seven years before any of those groups. And so I will likely, Ford Momentum will likely be that type. This is really a torture test of my own patience, of my own, it's spiritual for me. We make money in the sense that we need it to create the services. If we want to see an America that's competitive, then we're going to have to get it right. We're just one group that's seeding this very early. In 10 years, I would probably estimate that you will see lots of my affords. I definitely hope so. And that they will continue to innovate using better tools, using less analog. I'm very analog still. I'm a human's human. I use digital tools for data aggregation and for all of the baselines that you have to have to meet minimum standards. But I'm still very human, which is why I I like this. And so somebody's going to come there who's better, smarter, faster, more adept. I'm just here to like, ask the what ifs and start that and practice with persons like yourself. And then we build upon from there. I think that you're being very modest about what you have contributed. I think that what you're doing is pioneering work. And I just want to thank you for showing up today so authentically. Thank you. That's so kind of you. You're starting my day off. (laughs) So right. These are hard times for humans. Yeah, exactly. Where can our listeners find out more about you, about Ford Foundation? Ford Momentum. I'm not the Ford Foundation. Oh my gosh. I knew it. I was like, I had this blank. It's like menopause. I was like, uh, (laughs) Ford. If we were the Ford Foundation, girl, we would be doing this bigger. (laughs) I'd be like, Doria, yo, let's roll. (laughs) Hey, Ford Foundation, please call us. So I'm a human's human. I don't do social media too well. Our website is thefordmomentum.com. That's always updated. And I love to have conversations. I'm curious. Our team is curious. We're always learning. So my mom says, you know, are you open to being open? Are you being gentle with yourself? The answer is yes. And people can contribute information. We love to read but they can visit thefordmomentum.com and communicate with us that way. Excellent. And we will have all of that information in the episode when it comes out. And I cannot wait to have this come out. I have had such a lovely conversation with you today. Same. I mean, I can't wait. We'll have to meet up someplace out of the tech world. You've been listening to She Ventures. Like what you heard? You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and sign up for our newsletter so you never miss a show.